Chapter 4, Society. Describe how technological development has shaped the history of human societies. Analyze the importance of class conflict to the historical development of human societies. Demonstrate the importance of ideas to the development of human societies. Contrast the social bonds typical of traditional and modern societies. Summarize the contributions of Linsky, Marx, Wheat, Weber, and Durkheim to our understanding of social change. Chapter 4, page 89. Is computer technology such as internet accessible to everyone in the United States? For some, the internet is as close as their smartphone. However, others have never used this technology. Almost everyone who has earned a college degree is online, in contrast to only three quarters of adults who have not attended college. How would you explain this link between education and using the internet? Chapter Overview, chap page 90. We all live within a social world. This chapter explores how societies are organized and also explains how societies have changed over the centuries. The story of human societies over time is guided by the work of one of today's leading sociologists, Gerhard Linsky, and three of sociology's founders, Karl Marx, Max Weber, and Emil Durkheim. Sadidi Ag Inaka has never sent a text message. He has never spoken on a cell phone, and he has never logged on to the Internet. Does such a person really exist in today's high-technology world? Well, how about this? Neither Inaka nor anyone in his family has ever been to a movie, watched television, or even read a newspaper. Are these, visit are these people visitors from another planet? Prisoners on some remote island? Not at all. They are the Turagrig nomads who wander over the vast Sahara in the western African nation of Mali and Niger. Known as the Blue Men of the Desert for the following blue robes worn by both men and women, the Tuareg herd camels, goats, and sheep and live in camps where the sand blows and the daytime temperature often reaches 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Life is hard, but most Tuareg, Tuareg try to hold on to traditional ways. With a stern look, Inaka says, My father was a nomad. His father's was a nomad. I am a nomad. My children will be mo nomads. The Tuareg are among the world's poorest people. In times when there is little rain, they and their animals are at risk of losing their lives. Perhaps someday the Tuareg people can gain some of the wealth that comes from mining uranium below the deserts across which they have traveled for centuries. But whatever their economic faith, Inaka and his people are a society set apart with little knowledge of the larger world and none of its advantaged, advanced technology. But Inaka does not complain. This is the life of my ancestors. This is the life that we know. Society refers to people who interact in a defined territory and share a culture. In this chapter, you will learn more about human societies with the help of four important sociologists. We begin with the approach of Gerhard Linsky, who describes how societies have changed over the past 10,000 years. Linsky points to, points to the importance of technology in shaping any society. Then we turn to three of sociology's founders. Karl Marx, like Linsky, took a historical view of societies, but Marx's story of societies all about, is all about social conflict that arises as people work within an eco economic system to produce material goods. Max Weber tells a different story, showing that the power of ideas shapes society. Weber contrasted the traditional thinking of simple societies with the rational thought that dominates complex societies today. Finally, Emil Durkheim helps us see the different ways that, tr that traditional and modern societies hang together. All four visions of society answer a number of important questions. What makes the way of life of people what makes the way of life of people such as the Tuareg of the Sahara so different from your life as a college student in the United States? How and why do all societies change over time? What forces divide a society? What forces hold a society together? This chapter will provide answers to all these questions as we look at the work of important sociologists. Gerhard Linsky, Society and Technology. 
Describe how technological development has shaped the history of human societies. Members of our society who take things like television and texting for granted must wonder at the nomads of the Sahara who live the same simple life of their ancestors did centuries ago. The work of Gerhard Linsky helps us understand the great differences among societies that have existed through human history. Linsky uses the term socio-cultural evolution to mean changes that occur as a society gains new technology. With only simple technology, te societies such as Tuareg have little control over nature, so they can support just a small number of people. Societies with com complex technology, such as cars and cell phones, while not necessarily better, are certainly more productive so that they can support hundreds of millions of people with far more material affluence. Inventing or adopting new technology sends ripples of change throughout a society. When our ancestors first discovered how to make a sail so that the power of the wind could move a boat, they created a new form of transportation that eventually would take them to new lands, greatly expand their economy, and increase their military power. In addition, the more technology a society has, the faster it changes. Techno technologically simple societies change very slowly. Sadidi Aginaka says he lives the life of my ancestors. How many people in the U.S. society can say that they lived the way their grandparents or great-grandparents did? Because modern high-technology societies such as our own change so fast, people usually experience major social changes during a single lifetime. Imagine how surprised your great-grandmother would be to hear about Googling and text messaging and replacing hearts and test tube babies or 4G phones and iPads. Drawing on Linsky's work, we will examine five types of societies defined by their technology. Hunting and gathering societies, horticultural and pastoral societies, agrarian societies, industrial societies, and post-industrial societies. Characteristics of each of these types of societies are reviewed in the summing up table on page 92. In the simplest of all societies, people live by hunting and gathering, making use of simple tools to hunt animals and gather vegetation for food. From the time that our species appeared 3 million years ago until about 12,000 years ago, all humans were hunter-gatherers, hunter and gatherers. Even in the 1800s, Many hunting and gathering societies could be found around the world, but today just a few remain, including the Aka and Pygmies of Central Africa, the Bushmen of Southwestern Africa, the Aborigines of Australia, and the Kaska Indians of Northwestern Canada, the Batek and Semai of Malaysia, and isolated native people living in the Amazon forest, rainforest. With little ability to control their environment, <clears throat> Hunters and gatherers spend most of their time looking for game and collecting plants to eat. Only in lush areas with lots of food do hunters and gatherers have much time for much chance for leisure. Because it takes a lot, large amount of land to support even a few people, hunting and gathering societies have just a few dozen members. They must also be nomadic, moving on to find new sources of vegetation, or to follow migrating animals. Although they may return to favored sites, they rarely form permanent settlements. Hunting and gathering societies depend on the family to obtain and distribute food to protect its members and to teach their way of life to the children. Everyone's life is, pretty, is much the same. People spend most of their time getting their next meal. Age and gender have some effect on what individuals do. Healthy, indivi healthy adults do most of the work leaving the very young and the very old to help out as they can. Women gather vegetation, which provides most of the food, while men take on the less certain job of hunting. Although men and women perform different tasks, most hunters and gatherers probably see the sexes as having about the same social importance. Hunting and gathering societies usually have a shaman, or a spiritual leader, who enjoys high prestige but has to find has to work to find food like everyone else. In short, people in hunting and gathering societies come close to being socially equal. Hunting, hunters and gatherers use simple weapons, the spear, bow and arrow, and stone knife, but rarely do they use them to wage war. Their real enemy is the forces of nature. Severe storms and droughts can kill off their food, 
supply in a short span of time and there is little they can do for someone who has a serious accident or illness. Being constantly at risk in this way encourages people to cooperate and share, a strategy that raises everyone's chance of survival. But the truth is that many die in children, childhood and no more than half reach the age of 20. During the past century, societies with more powerful technology have closed in on the few remaining hunters and gatherers, reducing their food supply. As a result, hunting and gathering societies are disappearing. Fortunately, study, the study of this way of life has given us value information about human history and our basic ties to the natural world. Heading Horticulture and Pastoral Societies, page 92. Some 10 to 12,000 years ago, a new technology began to change the lives of human beings. People developed horticulture, the use of hand tools to raise crops. Using a hoe to work the soil and a digging stick to punch holes in the ground to plant seeds may not seem like something that would change the world, but these inventions allowed people to give up gathering in favor of growing food for themselves. The first human to plant garden gardens lived in fertile regions of the Middle East. Cultural diffusion spread the, this knowledge to America and Asia, Asia and eventually spread all over the world. Not all societies were quick to give up hunting and gathering for horticulture. Hunters and gatherers living where food was plentiful probably saw little reason to change their ways. People living in dry reason, regions such as the deserts of Africa or the Middle East or mountainous areas found little use for horticulture because they could not grow much anyway. People such such people, including the Tuareg, were more likely to adopt pastoralism, the domestication of animals. Today, societies that mix horticulture and pastoralism can be found throughout South America, Africa, and Asia. Because growing plants and raising animals greatly increased food production, populations expanded from dozens to hundreds of people. Pastoralists remain nomadic, leading their herds to fresh grazing lands. But horticulturalists formed settlements, moving only when the soil gave out. Joined by trade, these settlements formed extended societies with populations reaching into the thousands. Once a society is capable of producing a material surplus, more resources than are needed to feed the population, not everyone has to work at providing food. Greater specialization results. Some make crafts, while others engage in trade, cut hair, apply tattoos, or serve as priests. Compared to hunting and gathering societies, horticultural and pastoral societies are more socially diverse because of their members engage in a wider range of work. But being more productive does not make a society better in every sense. As some families produce more than others, they become richer and more powerful. Horticultural and pastoral societies have greater inequality, with elites using government power and military force to serve their own interests. The leaders do not have the ability to travel or to communicate over long distances, so they can control only a small number of people rather than rule over vast empires. Religion also differs among types of societies. Hunters and gatherers believe that many spirits inhabit the world. Horticulturalists, however, are more likely to think one of one god as the creator of the world. Pastoral societies carry this belief further, seeing God as directly involved in the well-being of the entire world. The pastoral roots of Ju Judaism and Christianity are evident in the term pastor, and the common view of God as shepherd, Lord is my shepherd, says Psalm 23, who stands watch over all us. Heading, Agrarian Societies, page 93. About 5,000 years ago, another revolution in technology was taking place in the Middle East, one that would end up changing life on Earth. This was the emergence of agriculture, large-scale cultivation using plows harnessed to animals or more powerful energy sources. So important was the invention of the animal-drawn plow along with other breakthroughs of the period, including irrigation, the wheel, riding, numbers, and the use of various metals, that this moment in history is often called the dawn of civilization. Using animal-drawn plows, 
farmers could cultivate fields far bigger than the garden-sized plots planted by horticulturalists. Plows have the added advantage of turning and aerating the soil, making it more fertile. As a result, farmers could work the same land for generations, encouraging the development of permanent settlements. With the ability to grow a surplus of food and to transport goods using animal-powered wagons, agrarian societies greatly expanded in size and population. About 100 CE, for example, the agrarian Roman Empire contained some 70 million people spread over 2 million square miles. Greater production meant even more specialization. Now there were dozens of distinct occupations from farmers to builders to metal workers. With so many people producing so many different things, people invented money as a common standard of exchange and the old barter system in which people traded one thing for another was abandoned. Agrarian societies have extremely have extreme social inequalities typically even more than modern societies such as our own. In most cases, a large number of people are peasants or slaves who do most of the work. Elites, therefore, have time for more refined activities, including the study of philosophy, art, and literature. This explains the historical link between high culture and social privilege noted in Chapter 3. Among hunter, hunter and, hunters and gatherers and among horticulturalists. Women provide most of the food, which gives them special importance. Agriculture, however, raises men to a position of social dominance. Using heavy metal plows pulled by large animals, agrarian societies put men in charge of food production. Women are left with support tasks, such as weeding and carrying the water to the fields. In agrarian societies, religion reinforces the power of the elite by defining both loyalty and hard work as moral obligations. Many of the a wonders of the ancient world, such as the Great Wall of China and the Great Pyramids of Egypt, were possible only because emperors and pharaohs had almost absolute power and could order their people to work for a lifetime without pay. Of the societies described so far, agrarian societies have the most social inequality. Agrarian technology also gives people a greater range of life choices, which is the reason that agrarian societies differ more from one another than horticultural and pastoral societies do. Heading Industrial Societies, page 94. Industrialism, which first took hold in the rich nations of today's world, is the production of goods using advanced sources of energy to drive large machinery. Until the industrial era began, the major source of energy had been muscles of humans and the animals they tended. Around 1750, people turned to water power, then steam boilers to operate mills and factories filled with larger and larger machines. Industrial technology gave people such power to alter their environment that change to alter their environment, that change took place faster than ever before. It, it is probably fair to say that the new industrial societies changed more in one century than the earlier agrarian societies had changed over the course of the previous thousand years. As explained in Chapter 1, change was so rapid it sparked the birth of sociology itself. By the 1900s, railroads crossed the land, steamships traveled the seas, and steel framed skyscrapers reached far higher than any of the old cathedrals that symbolized the agrarian age. But that was only the beginning. Soon, automobiles allowed people to move quickly almost anywhere, and electric electricity powered homes full of modern conveniences such as refrigerators, washing machines, air conditioners, and entertainment centers. Electronic communication began beginning with the telegraph and telephone and followed by the radio, television, and computers gave people the ability to reach others instantly all over the world. Work also changed. In agrarian communities, most men and women worked in a home and in the fields nearby. Industri industrialization drew people away from the homes to the factories situated near energy sources, sources such as coal fields that powered their machinery. The result was a weakening of close working relationship, strong family ties, and many of the traditional values, beliefs, and customs that 
Guide Agrarian Life. Entry, December 28, Moray in the Andes Highland of Peru. We were high in the mountains in a small community of several dozen families, miles from the nearest electric line or paved road. At about 12,000 feet, breathing is hard for most people, not used to the thin air, so we walk slowly. But hard work seems to be no problem for the man and his son out on a field near their home, tilling the soil with a horse and plow. Too poor to buy a tractor, these people still till the land in the same way their ancestors did 500 years ago. With industrialization, occupational specialization became greater than ever. Today, the kind of work you do, you do has a lot to do with your standard of living. So people now often size up one another in terms of their jobs rather than according to their family ties as agrarian peoples do. Rapid change in people's tendency to move to, from place to place also make social life more anonymous, increase cultural diversity, and promote subcultures and countercultures as described in Chapter 3. Industrial technology changes the family, too, reducing its traditional importance as the center of social life. No longer does the family serve as the main setting for work, learning, and religious worship. As Chapter 18, Families Explain, Technological change also plays a part in making families more diverse, with a greater share of single people, divorced people, single parent families, and step families. Perhaps the greatest effect of industrialization has been to raise living standards, which increased fivefold in the United States over the past century. Although at first new technology only benefit the elite few, industrial technology is so productive that over time, just about everyone's income rises so that people live longer and more comfortable lives. Even social inequality decreases slightly, as explained in Chapter 10, because industrial societies provide extended schooling and greater politi political rights for everyone. Around the world, industrialization has had the effect of increasing the demand for a greater political voice, a pattern evident in the South Korea, Taiwan, and the People's Republic of China, the nations of Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, and in 2011 in Egypt and other nations of the Middle East. Heading Post-Industrial Societies, page 95. Many industrial societies, including the U.S., have now entered a new phase of technological development, and we can extend Linsky's analysis to take account of recent trends. A generation ago, the sociologist Daniel Bell coined the term post-industrialism to refer to the production of information using computer technology. Production in industrial societies centers on factories and machinery generating material goods. Post-industrial production relies on computers and other electronic devices that create, process, store, and apply information. Just as people in the industrial societies learn mechanical skills, people in the post-industrial societies, such as ours, develop information-based skills and carry out their work using computers and other forms of high-technology communication. A post-industrial society uses less and less of its labor force for industrial production, and the work can be performed almost anywhere. At the same time, more jobs become available for clerical workers, teachers, writers, sales managers and marketing representatives, all of whom have in common jobs that process involve, involve processing information. The information revolution, which is at the heart of the post-industrial society, is most evident in rich nations, yet new information technology affects people in all countries around the world. As discussed in Chapter 3, a worldwide flow of products, people, and information now links societies and has advantage, advanced a global culture. In this sense, the post-industrial society is at the heart of globalization. Heading, the limits of technology. More complex technology has made life better by raising productivity, reducing infectious disease, and sometimes just relieving boredom. But technology provides no quick fix for social problems. Poverty, for example, remains a reality for some 45.3 million women and men in the U.S., and just over 1 billion people worldwide. Technology also creates new problems that our ancestors and people like Sadidi Ag Inaka today could hardly imagine. Industrial and post-industrial societies gives us more personal freedom, but they also lack of sense, a community, sense of community that was part of pre-industrial life. 
Most seriously, an increasing number of the world's nations have, include, have used nuclear technology to build weapons that could send the entire world back to the Stone Age if humanity survives at all. Advancing technology has also threatened the physical environment. Each stage in the social cultural evolution has introduced more powerful sources of energy and increased our appetite for Earth's, Earth's resources. Ask yourself whether we can continue to pursue material prosperity without permanently damaging our planet by consuming its limited resources or poisoning, poisoning it with pollution. Technological advances Jizz. advances have uh, improved life and brought the world's people world's people closer but establishing peace ensuring justice and protecting the environment are problems that technology alone cannot solve heading page 95 Karl Marx society and conflict analyze the importance of class conflict to historical development of human societies the first of our classic visions of society comes from Karl Marx, 1818 through 1883, an early giant in the field of sociology whose influence continues today. Keenly aware of how industrial revolution has changed Europe, Marx spent most of his adult life in London, the capital of what was then the vast British Empire. He was awed by the size of, by the size and productive power of the new factories going up all over Britain. Along with other industrial nations, Britain was producing more goods than ever before, drawing ma raw materials from around the world and churning out finished products at a dizzying rate. What astonished Marx even more was the riches produced by this new technology ended up in the hands of only a few people. As he walked around the city of London, he could see for himself that a few that a handful of aristocrats and industrialists enjoyed the lives of luxury and privilege, living in fabulous mansions staffed by many servants. At the same time, most people lived in slums and labored long hours for low wages. Some even slept in the streets, where they were likely to die young from diseases brought on by cold and poor nutrition. Marx saw his society in terms of a basic contradiction. In a country so rich, how could so many people be so poor? Just as important, he asked, how can this situation be changed? Many people think Marx set out to tear societies apart, but he was motivated by compassion and wanted to help a badly divided society create a new and more just social order. At the heart of Marx's thinking is the idea of social conflict, the struggle between segments of society over valued resources. Social can conflict can, of course, take on many forms. Individuals quarrel, colleges have long-standing sports rivalries, and nations sometimes go to war. For Marx, however, the most important type of social conflict was class conflict arising from the way society produces material goods. Figure 4.1, page 96, superstructure, uh, a triangle with ideas and values on top, in the middle, social institutions, politics, religion, education, and family, and at the base is the economy. This diagram illustrates Marx's materialist view that the system of economic production shapes the entire society. Economic production involves both technology, industry in the case of capitalism, and social relationships. For capitalism, the relationship between capitalists who own the factories and businesses and workers who provide the labor. On this infrastructure or foundation rests society's superstructure, including its major social institutions as well as core cultural values and ideas. Marx maintained that every part of a society operates to support the economic system. Heading, Society and Production, page 96. Living in the 19th century, Marx observed that the early decades of industrial capitalism in Europe. This economic system, Marx explained, turned a small part of the population into capitalists, people who own and operate factories and other businesses in pursuit of profits. A capitalist tries to make a profit by selling a product for more than its cost to produce. Capitalism turns out most of the population 
turns most of the population into industrial workers, whom Marx calls proletarians, people who sell labor for their for wages. To Marx, a system of capitalist production always ends up creating conflict between capitalists and workers. To keep profits high, capitalists keeps wages low, but workers want higher wages. Since profits and wages come from the same pool of funds, the result is conflict. As Marx saw it, this conflict could only end, end only with the end of capitalism itself. All societies are composed of social institutions, the major spheres of social life or societal subsystems organized to meet human needs. Examples of social institutions include the economy, the political system, the family, religion, education, and education. In his analysis of society, Marx argued that the, one of the institutions, the economy, dominates all others and defines the character of the entire society, drawing on the philosophical approach called materialism, which says that how humans produce goods, material goods, shapes their experience. Marx believed that other social institutions all operate in a way that supports a society's economy. Linsky focused on how technology molds a society, but for Marx, it is the economy that forms a society's real foundation. Marx viewed the economic system as society's infrastructure, infra in, in Latin meaning below. Other social institutions, including the family, the political system, and religion, are built on this foundation. They form society's superstructure and support the economy. Marx's theory is illustrated in Figure 4.1. For example, under capitalism, the legal system protects capitalists' wealth, and the family allows capitalists to pass their property from one generation to the next. Marx was well aware that most people living in an industrial capitalist system do not recognize how capitalism shapes the operation of their entire society. Most people, in fact, regard the right to own private property or pass it on to their children as natural. In the same way, many of us tend to see rich people as having earned their money through long years of schooling and hard work. We see the poor, on the other hand, as lacking skills and the personal drive to make them make more of themselves. Marx rejected this type of thinking, called it false consciousness, explaining social problems as shortcomings of individuals rather than the flaws of society. Marx was saying, in, in effect, that it is not the people who make society so unequal, but rather the system of capitalist production. False consciousness, he believed, hurts people by hiding the real cause of their problems. Heading Conflict in History For Marx, conflict is the engine that drives social change. Sometimes societies change at a slow evolutionary rate, but they may erupt in rapid revolutionary change. To Marx, early hunters and gatherers formed primitive communist societies. Communism is a system in which people commonly own and equally share food and other things they produce. People in hunting and gathering societies do not have much, but they share what they have. In addition, because everyone does the same kind of work, there are no class differences and thus little chance of social conflict. With technological advance comes social inequality. Among horticulture, pastoral, and early agrarian societies, which Marx lumped together as the ancient world, warfare was frequent and the victors turned their captives into slaves. Agriculture brings still more wealth to a society's elite, but does little for most other people who labor as serfs and are barely better off than slaves. As Marx saw it, the state supported the feudal system in which the elite or nobility had all the power, assisted by the church, which claimed that this ar arrangement reflected the will of God. This is why Marx thought that feudalism was simply exploit exploitation veiled by religious and political illusions. Gradually, new productive forces started breaking down the feudal order. As trade steadily increased, cities grew and merchants and skilled craft workers formed the new capitalist class or bourgeoisie, a French word meaning people of the town. After the 1800 bourgeoisie also controlled factories, becoming richer and richer so that they soon rivaled the ancient land-owning nobility. For their part, the nobles looked down their noses at 
this upstart commercial class, but in time, these capitalists took control of European societies. To Marx's way of thinking, then, new technology was the only part of the Industrial Revolution. It also served, was only a part, was only part of the Industrial Revolution. It also served as a class revolution in which capitalists overthrew the agrarian elite. Industrialization also led to the formation of the proletariat. English landowners converted fields once plowed by, plowed by serfs into grazing land for sheep to produce wool for textile mills. Forced from the land, millions of people migrated to the cities and had little choice but to work in factories. Marx envisioned these workers one day joining together to form a revolutionary class that would overthrow the capitalist system. Heading, Capitalism and Class Conflict. The history of all hitherto, I don't know, existing society is the history of class struggles. With these words, Marx and his collaborators, Frederick Engels, began their best known statement, the Manifesto of the Communist Party. Industrial capitalism, like earlier types of society, contains two major social classes. The ruling class, whose members, capitalists or bourgeoisie, own a productive property, and the oppressed, the proletarians, who sell their labor, reflecting the two basic positions in the productive system, like masters and slaves in the ancient world and like nobles and serfs in the feudal system, Capitalists and proletariats are engaged in class conflict today. Currently, as in the past, one class controls the other as productive property. Marx used the term class conflict, sometimes class struggle, to refer to the conflict between the entire classes over the distribution of a society's wealth and power. Class conflict is nothing new. What distinguishes the conflict in capitalist society, Marx pointed out, is how how in the open it is. Agrarian nobles and serfs, for all their differences, were bound together by traditions and mutual obligations. Industrial capitalism dissolved those ties so that loyalty and honor were replaced by naked self-interest. Because the proletarians had no personal ties to the capitalists, Marx saw no reason for them to put up with their oppression. Marx knew that the revolution would not come easy. First, workers must become aware of their oppression and see capitalism as its true cause. Second, they must organize and act to address their problems. This means that false consciousness must be replaced with class consciousness. Workers' recognitions of themselves as a class unified in opposition to capitalists and ultimately to capitalism itself, because the inhumanity of early, early capitalism was plain for him to see. Marx concluded that industrial workers would soon rise up to destroy this economic system. How would the capitalists react? Their wealth made them strong, but Marx saw a weakness in the capitalist armor. Motivated by a desire for personal gain, capitalists feared competition with other capitalists. Marx predicted, therefore, that capitalists would be slow to band together despite their common interests. In addition, he reasoned capitalists kept employees' wages low in order to maximize profits, which made the workers' misery even greater. In the long run, Marx believed capitalists would bring about their own undoing. Page 98, Capitalism and Alienation. Marx also condemned capitalist society for producing alienation, the experience of isolation and misery resulting from powerlessness. To the capitalists, workers are nothing more than a source of labor to be hired and fired at will. Dehumanized by their jobs, repetitive factory job work, in the past processing orders on a computer today, workers find little satisfaction and feel unable to improve their situation. Here we see another contradiction of capitalist society. As people develop technology to gain power over the world, the capitalist economy gains more control over people. Marx noted four ways in which capitalism alienates workers. One, alienation from the act of working. Ideally, people work to meet their needs and to develop their personal potential. Capitalism, however, denies workers a say in what they make or how they make it. Further, much of the work is a repetition of routine tasks. The fact that today we replace workers with machines whenever possible would not have surprised Marx. As far as he was concerned, capitalists has, 
had turned human beings into machines long ago. Two, alienation from products of work. The product of work belongs not to the workers, but to capitalists who sell it for profit. Thus, Marx reasoned, the more of themselves workers invest in their work, the more they lose. Three, alienation from other workers. Through work, Marx claimed people build bonds of community. Industrial capitalism, however, makes work competitive than co cooperative, setting each person apart from everyone else and offering little chance for companionship. Four, alienation from human potential. Industrial capitalism alienates workers from their human potential. Marx argued that a worker does not fulfill himself in his work but denies himself, has a feeling of misery rather than well-being, does not freely develop his physical and mental energies but is physically exhausted, and mental energies, wait, and mentally debased. The worker, therefore, feels himself to be at home only during his leisure time, whereas at work he feels homeless. In short, industrial capitalism turns an activity that should, ex should express the best qualities in human beings into a dull and dehumanizing experience. Marx viewed alienation in its various forms as a barrier to social change, but he hoped that industrial workers would overcome their alienation by uniting into a true social class aware of the cause of their problems and ready to change society. Heading Revolution The only way out of the trap of capitalism, Marx argued, is to remake society. He imagined a system of production that could provide for the social needs of all. He called this system socialism. Although Marx knew that the dramatic change would not come easy, he must have been disappointed that he did not live to see workers in England rise up. Still convinced that capitalism was a social evil, he believed that in, the, in time the working majority would realize they held the key to a better future. This change would certainly be revolutionary and perhaps even violent. Marx believed that a socialist society would bring class conflict to an end. Chapter 10 explains more about changes in the industrial capitalist society since Marx's time and why the revolution he envisioned never took place. In addition, Chapter 17, Politics and Government, explains Marx failed to foresee that revolution he imagined could take place in the form of repressive regimes, such as Stalin's government in the Soviet Union that ended up killing tens of thousands of people. In his own time, Marx looked towards the future with hope, the proletarian Proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. Page 99, Max Weber, The Rationalization of Society, demonstrate the importance of ideas to the development of human societies. With a wide range of Ing, with a wide-ranging knowledge of law, economics, religion, and history, Max Weber, 1864-1920, produced what many ex experts regard as the greatest individual contribution ever made to sociology. The scholar, born to a prosperous family in Germany, had much to say about how modern society differs from earlier types of social organization. Weber understood the power of technology in he shared many of Marx's ideas about social conflict, but he disagreed with Marx's philosophy of materialism. Weber's philosophical approach called idealism emphasized how human ideas, especially beliefs and values, shape society. He argued most Im the most important difference among societies is not how people produce things, but how people think about the world. In Weber's view, Modern society was a product of a new way of thinking. Weber compared societies in different times and places. To make the comparison, he re relied on the ideal type, an abstract statement of the essential characteristic of any social phenomenon. That again, he relied on the ideal type, an abstract statement of the essential characteristics of any social phenomenon. Following Weber's approach, for example, we might speak of the pre-industrial society and the industrial society as ideal types. The use of the word ideal does not mean that one or the other is good or best, nor does an ideal type refer to any actual society. Rather, think of an ideal type as a way of defining a type of society in its pure form. We have 
already use the ideal type in comparing hunting and gathering societies with industrial societies and capitalism with socialism. Heading Two Worldviews, Tradition and Rationality, page 99. Rather than categorizing societies according to their technology or productive systems, Weber focused on ways that people think about their world. Members of pre-industrial societies, Weber explained, are bound by tradition, and people in industrial capitalist societies are guided by rationality. By tradition, Weber meant values and beliefs passed from generation to tradition. Generation to generation. So that again, by tradition, Weber meant values and beliefs passed from generation to generation. In other words, traditional people are guided by the past and they feel a strong attachment to a long established ways of life. They consider particular actions right and proper mostly because they have been accepted for so long. People in modern societies, however, favor rationality, a way of thinking that emphasizes deliberate matter-of-fact calculation of most efficient ways to accomplish a particular task. Sentimental ties to the past have no place in a rational worldview, and tradition becomes simply one type of information. Typically, modern people think and act on the basis of what they see as the present and future consequences of their choices. They evaluate jobs, schooling, even relationships in terms of what they put into them and what they expect to receive in return. Weber viewed both the Industrial Revolution and the development of capitalism as evidence of modern rationality. Such changes are all part of a rationaliz the rationalization of society, the historical change from tradition to rationality as the main type of human thought. Weber went on to describe modern society as disenchanted because scientific thinking has swept away most of people's sentimental ties to the past. The eagerness to develop new technology and the willingness of people to adopt it as part of their daily lives are strong indicators of how rationalized society, a res society, how rationalized a society is. To illustrate the global patterns of Rationalization, Global Map 4.1 shows where in the world personal computers are found. In general, members of high-income societies in the New York, North America and Europe use personal computers the most, but these devices are rare in low-income nations. Why are some societies more eager than others to develop and adopt new technology? Those with a more rational worldview might consider new computer or magnetical technology a breakthrough, but those with very traditional cultures might reject such devices as a threat to their way of life. The Tuareg nomads of northern Mali, described at the beginning of this cha chapter, shrug off the ideas of using telephones. Why would anyone herding animals in the desert need a cell phone? Similarly, in the United States, the Amish refuse to have telephones in their homes because it is not part of their traditional way of life. In Weber's view, whether there is a lot or very little technological innovation depends on how a society's people understand their world. Many people throughout history have the, had the opportunity to adopt new technology, but only in rational cultural climate of Western Europe did people exploit scientific discoveries to spark the Industrial Revolution. Page 101, Is Capitalism Rational? Is capitalism a rational economic system? Here again, Weber and Marx ended up on different sides. Weber uh, considered the industrial capitalism highly rational because the capitalists try to make money in any way they can. Marx, however, thought capitalism irrational because it fails to meet the needs of most of the people. Weber's greatest thesis, Protestantism and Capitalism. Weber spent many years considering how and why industrial capitalism developed in the first place. Why did it emerge in parts of Western Europe during the 18th and 19th centuries? Weber claimed that the key to the birth of industrialism Industrial capitalism laid in the Protestant Reformation. Specifically, he saw industrial capitalism as a major outcome of Calvinism, a Christian religious movement founded by John Calvin. Calvinists approach life in a formal and rational way that Weber characterized as inner worldly ascetism. This mindset leads people to deny 
themselves worldly pleasures in favor of a highly disciplined focus on economic pursuits. In practice, Calvinism encouraged people to put their time and energy into their work. In modern terms, we might say that such individuals become good business people or entrepreneurs. Another of Calvin's most important ideas was predestination, the belief that an all-knowing, all-powerful God had predestined some people for salvation and others for damnation. Believing that everyone's fate was set before birth, early Calvinists thought that people could only guess at what their destiny was and that, in any case, they could not do nothing to change it. So Calvinists swung between hopeful visions of spiritual salvation and anxious fears of eternal damnation. Frustrated at not knowing their fate, Calvinists gradually became, came to a resolution of sorts. Wouldn't those chosen for glory in the next world, they reason, see signs of divine favor in this world? In this way, Calvinists came to see worldly prosperity as a sign of God's grace. Eager to gain this reassurance, Calvinists threw themselves in a quest for business success, applying rationality, discipline, and hard work to their task. They were certainly pursuing wealth, but they were doing this for the sake of money. They were not doing this for the sake of money, at least not to spend it on themselves because any self-indulgence would be sinful. Neither were Calvinists likely to use their wealth for charity. To share their wealth with the poor seemed to go against God's will because they viewed poverty as a sign of God's rejection. Calvinists' duty was pressing forward in what they saw as their personal calling from God, reinvesting the money they made for greater, still greater success. It is easy to see how this, such an activity, saving money, using wealth to create more wealth, and adopting new technology became the foundation of capitalism. Other world religions did not encourage the rational pursuit of wealth the, with the way Calvinism did. Catholicism, the traditional religion in most of Europe, taught a passive otherworldly view. Good deeds performed humbly on earth would bring rewards in heaven. For Catholics, making money had none of the spiritual significance it had for Calvinists. Weber concluded that this was the reason for that industrial capitalism developed primarily in areas of Europe where Calvinism was strong. Favor's study of Calvinism provides striking evidence of the power and ideas to shape society. Not one to accept simple explanation, Faber knew that industrial capitalism had many causes, but by stressing the importance of ideas, Faber tried to counter Marx's strictly economic explanation of modern society. As decades passed, later generations of Calvinists lost much of their early religious enthusiasm. But their drive for success and personal discipline remained, and what started out as a religious ethic was gradually transformed into a work ethic. In this sense, Weber considered industrial capitalism to be disenchanted religion, with wealth no longer valued as a sign of salvation for its own sake. This transformation is seen in the fact that practice of accounting, which to early Calvinists meant keeping a daily record of their moral deeds before long came before long came to mean simply keeping track of money. Page 101, Rational Social Organization. According to Weber, rationality is the basis of modern society, giving rise to both the Industrial Revolution and capitalism. He went on to identify seven characteristics of rational social organization. One, distinctive social institutions. In hunting and gathering societies, the family is the center of all activity. Gradually, however, religious, political, and economic systems develop as separate social institutions. In modern societies, new institutions, including education and healthcare, also appear. Specialized institutions are a rational strategy, strategy to meet human needs efficiently. Two, large-scale organizations. Modern rationality can be seen in the spread of large-scale organizations. As early as the horticultural era, small groups of political officials made decisions concerning religious observances, public works, and warfare. By the time Europe had developed agrarian societies, the Catholic Church had grown into a much larger organization with thousands of officials. In today's modern rational society, almost everyone works for fo large formal organizations 
and federal and state government employ tens of thousands of workers. Page 102. Three, specialized tasks. Unlike members of traditional societies, people in modern societies are likely to have very specialized jobs. The yellow pages suggest just how many thousands of different occupations there are today. Number four, personal discipline. Modern societies put a premium on self-discipline. Most businesses and government organizations expect their workers to be disciplined, and a discipline focused on the job is also encouraged by our cultural values of achievement and success. Five, awareness of time. In traditional societies, people measure time according to the rhythm of suns and seasons. Modern people, by contrast, schedule events precisely by the hour or and even the minute. Clocks began appearing in European cities some 500 years ago. About the same time, commerce began to expand. Soon people began to think that time is money, to borrow from Benjamin Franklin's phrase. Number six, technical competence. Members of a traditional society, members of traditional society size up one another on the basis of who they are, their family ties. Modern rationality leads us to judge people according to what they are with an, with an eye toward their education, skills, and abilities. Most workers have to keep up with the latest skills and knowledge in their field in order to be successful in personality. In a rational society, this is number seven, technical competence is the basis for hiring, so the world becomes impersonal. People interact as specialists concerned with a particular task rather than individuals concerned with one another as people. Because showing your feelings can threaten personal discipline, modern people tend to devalue emotion. All these characteristics can be found in one important expression of modern rationality, bureaucracy. Uh, heading, Rationality, Bureaucracy, and Science, page 102. Weber considered the growth of large rational organizations one of the defining traits of modern society. Another term for this society, or this type of organization, is bureaucracy. Weber believed that bureaucracy has much in common with capitalism, another key factor in today's in modern social life. Today, it is primarily the capitalist market economy which demands that the official business of public administration be discharged precisely, unambiguously, continuously, and with as much speed as possible. Normally, the very large capitalist enterprises are themselves unequal models of strict bureaucratic organizations. That's some sort of input from somewhere. Uh, I guess that's a Weber's explanation. Uh, as Chapter 7, Groups and Organizations, explain, we find aspects of bureaucracy in today's businesses, government agencies, labor unions, and universities. Weber considered bureaucracy highly rational because its elements, offices, duties, and policies, help achieve specific goals as efficiently as possible. To Weber, capitalism bureaucracy, and also science, the highly disciplined pursuit of knowledge, are all expressions of the same underlying factors that define modern society, rationality. Heading, Rationality and Alienation. Weber agreed with Marx that industrial capitalism was highly productive. Weber also agreed with Marx that modern society generates widespread alienation, although Weber pointed to different reasons. Marx thought alienation was caused by economic inequality. Weber blamed alienation on bureaucracies' countless rules and regulations. Bureaucracies, Weber, Weber warned, treated a human being as a number or a case rather than a unique individual. In addition, working for large organizations demands highly specialized and often tedious routines. In the end, Weber saw modern society as vast and a vast and growing system of rules trying to regulate everything, and he feared that modern society would end up crushing the human spirit. Like Marx, Weber found it ironic that modern society, meaning to serve humanity, turns on its creators and enslaves them. Just as Marx described the dehumanizing effects of industrial capitalism, Weber portrayed the modern individual as only a small cog in a care ceaselessly moving mechanism that prescribes him and prescribes to him an endless fixed routine of march 
Although Weber could see the advantages of modern society, he was deeply pessimistic about the future. He feared in the end the rationalization of society would bring human beings, would reduce human beings to robots. Heading, Emile Durkheim, Society and Function, page 103, contrasts the social bonds typical of traditional and modern societies. The love society is love something beyond us and something in ourselves. These are the words of the French sociologist Emile Durkheim, another of the discipline's founders. In Durkheim's ideas, we find another important vision of human society. Heading, structure, society beyond ourselves. Emile Durkheim's great insight was recognizing that society exists beyond ourselves. Society is more than the individuals who compose it. Society was he long before here, long before we were born. It shapes us while we are alive, and it will remain long after we are gone. Patterns of human behavior, cultural norms, values, and beliefs exist as established structures or social facts that have an objective reality beyond the lives of individuals. Because society is bigger than any of us, it has the power to guide our thoughts and actions. This is why studying individuals alone, as psychologists or biologists do, can never capture the heart of social experience. A classroom of college students taking a math exam, a family gathered around the table sharing a meal, people quietly waiting their turn in a doctor's office, all are examples of the countless situations that have a family, familiar organization apart from any particular individual who has ever been part of them. Once created by people, Durkheim claimed society takes on a life of its own and demands a measure of obedience from its creators. We experience the power of society when we see lives falling into common patterns or when we feel the tug of morality at a moment during a moment of temptation. Heading function society as a system. Having established that society has structure, Durkheim turned to the concept of function, the significance of any social fact, he explained, is more than what individuals see in their immediate lives. Social facts help along the operation of society as a whole. Consider crime. As victims of crimes, individuals experience pain and loss. But taking a broader view, Durkheim saw that crime is vital to the ongoing life of society itself. As Chapter 9, Deviance explains, only by defining acts as wrong do people construct and defend morality which gives direction and meanings to our collective life. For this reason, Durkheim rejected the common view of crime as abnormal. On the contrary, he concluded crime is normal for the most basic of reasons. A society could not exist without it. Heading, Personality, Society in Ourselves, page 103. Durkheim said that society is not only beyond ourselves, but also in ourselves, helping to form our personalities. How we act, think, and feel is drawn from society that nurtures us. Society shapes us in another way as well by providing the moral discipline that guides our behavior and controls our desires. Durkheim believed that humans, human beings need the restraint of society because as creatures who can want more and more, we are in constant danger of being overpowered by our own desires. As he put it, the more one has, the more one wants, since satisfa satisfaction received only stimulate instead of filling needs. Nowhere is the need for social regulation better illustrated than in Durkheim's study of suicide, which is described in Chapter 1, The Social Perspective. Why is it that rock stars from Del Shannon, Elvis Presley, Janis Joplin, Jim Morrison to Jimi Hendrix, Keith Moon, Kurt Cobain, Michael Jackson, and Whitney Houston seem so prone to self-destruction. Durkheim had the answer long before the invention of the electric guitar. Now, as back then, the highest suicide rates are found among categories people with the lowest level of social integration. In short, the enormous freedom of the young, rich, and famous carries a high price in terms of the risk of suicide. Heading, Modernity and Anomie, A-N-O-M-I-E, Anomie, page 104. Compared to traditional societies, modern societies impose fewer restrictions on everyone. 
Durkheim acknowledged the advantages of modern-day freedom, but he warned increased anomie, a condition in which society provides little moral guidance to individuals. The turbulent lives of, of many celebrities, think of Justin Bieber or Lindsay Lohan, and the more serious patterns by which celebrities can be destroyed by fame, think of Michael Jackson, well illustrates the destructive effects of anomi. Sudden fame tears people from their families and familiar routines, disrupts established values and norms, and breaks down society's support and regulation of the individuals, sometimes with fatal results. Therefore, Durkheim explained that individuals' desires must be balanced by the claims and guidance of society, a balance that is sometimes difficult to achieve in the modern world. Durkheim would not have been surprised to see a rising suicide rate in modern societies such as the United States. Heading, Evolving Societies, the Division of Labor. Like Marx, and Dur like Marx and Weber, Durkheim lived through the rapid social change that swept across Europe during the 19th century as the Industrial Revolution unfolded. But Durkheim offered his own understanding of this change. In pre-industrial societies, he explained, tradition operates as society, social... El so bleh. In pre-industrial societies, he explained tradition operates as the social cement, cement that binds people together. In fact, what he learned, he termed the collective conscious conscience, is so strong that the community moves quickly to punish anyone who dares to challenge conventional ways of life. Durkheim used the term mechanical solidarity to refer to social bonds based on common sentiments and shared moral values that are strong among members of pre-industrial societies. In practice, mechanical solidarity is based on similarity. Durkheim called these bonds mechanical because people are linked in lockstep with more or less automatic sense of belonging together and acting alike. With industrialization, Durkheim continued, mechanical solidarity becomes weaker and weaker and people are much less bound by tradition. But this does not mean that society dissolves. Modern life creates a new type of solidarity. Durkheim called this new social integration organic solidarity, defined as social bonds based on specialization and inter interdependence that are strong among members of industrial societies. The solidarity that was once rooted in the in likeness is now based on differences among people who find that their specialized work as plumbers, college students, midwives, or sociology instructors, makes them rely on other people for most of their daily needs. For Durkheim, then, the key to change in a society is expanding division of labor or specialized economic activity. Weber said that modern societies specialize in order to become more efficient, and Durkheim filled out, filled out the picture by showing that members of modern societies count on tens of thousands of others, most of them strangers, for goods and services needed every day. As members of modern societies, we depend more and more on people we trust less and less. Why do we look to people we hardly know and whose beliefs may differ from our own? Durkheim answer was because we can't live without them. So modern society rests far less on moral conscious consensus and far more on functional interdependence. Herein lies what we might call the Durkheim's dilemma. The technological power and greater personal freedom of modern society come at the cost of declining morality and the risk of anomy. Like Marx and Weber, Durkheim worried about the direction society was taking, but of the three, Durkheim was the most optimistic. He saw that large, anonymous societies gave people more freedom and privacy than small towns. Anomy remains a danger, but Durkheim hoped we would be able to create laws and other norms to regulate our behavior. How can we apply Durkheim's view of views to the information revolution. The seeing sociology in everyday life box on page 106 suggests that Durkheim, as well as two of the other theorists whose ideas we've dis considered in this chapter, would have much to say about today's new computer technology. 
Heading one of page one o five. Critical review. Four visions of society. Summarize the contributions of Linsky, Marx, Weber, and Durkheim to our understanding of social change. This chapter opened with several important questions about society. We will conclude by summarizing how each of these four visions of society answer these questions. What holds societies together? How is something as complex as society possible? Linsky claims that members of a society are united by a shared culture, although cultural patterns become more diverse as society gains more complex technology. He also pointed out that as technology becomes more complex, inequality divides a society more and more. Although industrialization reduces inequality somewhat, Marx saw in society not only not unity but social division based on class position. From his point of view, elites may force an uneasy peace. But true social unity can occur only if production becomes a cooperative process. To Weber, the members of society share a worldview. Just as tradition, just as tradition joined people together in the past, so modern societies have created rational, large-scale organizations that connect people's lives. Finally, Durkheim. Made solidarity the focus of work. He contrasted the mechanical solidarity of pre-industrial societies, which is based on shared morality, with modern societies' organic solidarity, which is based on specialization. How have societies changed? According to Linsky's model of socio-cultural evolution, societies differ mostly in terms of changing technology. Modern society stands out from past societies in terms of its enormous productive power. Marx too noted historical differences in productivity, yet pointed to continuing social conflict, except perhaps among simple hunter. And gatherers. For Marx, modern society is distinctly mostly because it brings that conflict out into the open. Weber considered the question of change from the perspective of how people looked at the world. Members of pre-industrial societies have a traditional outlook. Modern people take a rational worldview. Finally, for Durkheim, traditional societies are characterized by mechanical solidar- solidarity based on moral likeness. In modern industrial societies, mechanical solidarity gives way to organic solidarity based on productive specialization. Heading: Why do societies change? As Linsky sees it, society, social change comes about through technological innovation that, over time, transforms an entire society. Marx's materialist approach to highlights the struggle between classes as the engine of change, pushing societies towards revolution. Favor, by contrast, pointed out that ideas contra- contribute to social change. He demonstrated how a particular worldview, Calvinism, set in motion the industrial revolution, which ended up reshaping all of society. Finally, Durkheim pointed to an, an expanding division of labor as the key dimension of social change. The fact that these four approaches are so different does not mean that any. One of them is right or wrong in the absolute sense. Society is exceedingly complex, and our understanding of society benefits from applying all four visions. Page one hundred six: Seeing sociology in everyday life. Today's information revolution. What would Durkheim, Weber, and Marx have thought? Conversation. Colleen. Didn't Marx predict there'd be a class revolution? Masako. Well, yes, but in the information age, what are classes that are supposed to be in conflict? New technology is changing our society at a dizzying pace. Were they alive today, the founding sociologists discussed in this chapter would be eager observers of the current scene. Imagine for a moment the kind of questions Emil Durkheim, Max Weber, and Karl Marx might ask of the effects of computer technology on our everyday lives. Durkheim, who emphasized the increasing division of labor in modern society, would probably wonder if new information technology is pushing work specialization even further. There is good reason to think that it is, because electronic communication, say website, gives anyone a vast market. Currently, about three billion people across the internet. People can specialize far more than if they were trying to make a living in a small geographic area. For example, most. Small town lawyers have a general practice. An information age attorney living anywhere can provide specialized guidance on, say, prenuptial agreements or electronic copyright law. 
As we move into the electronic age, the number of highly specialized small businesses, some of which end up becoming very large in all fields, is increasing rapidly. Durkheim might also point out that the internet threatens to increase our experience of anime. Using computers has a tendency to isolate people from personal relationships with others. In one recent survey, 9 out of 10 people in the United States said that they sometimes or often felt ignored by someone in their own home who was spending too much time texting or otherwise using a mobile device. Perhaps, as analyst puts it, as we expect more from our machines, we expect less from each other. An additional problem is that although the internet offers a flood of information, it provides little in the way of moral guidance about what is wise or good or worth knowing. Weber believed that modern societies are distinctive because their members share a rational worldview. And nothing illustrates this worldview better than bureaucracy. What will bureaucracy be as but will bureaucracy be as important during the 21st century? Here is one reason to think it may not. Although organizations will probably continue to regulate workers <clears throat> performing the kind of routine tasks that are in common in the industrial era. <sighs> Much work in the post-industrial era involves imagination. Consider the New Age work as designing homes, composing music, and writing software. This kind of creative work cannot be regulated in the same way as putting together automobiles as they move down an assembly line. Perhaps this is the reason many high-technology companies have done away with worker dress codes and having employees punch in and out on a time clock. Finally, what might Marx make of the information revolution? Since Marx considered the earlier industrial revolution a class revolution that allowed the owners of industry to dominate society, he would probably be concerned about the emergence of a new symbolic elite. Some analysts point out that film and television writers, producers, and performers now enjoy vast wealth, international prestige, and enormous power. Just as people without industrial skills stayed at the bottom of the class, in past decades, so people without symbolic skills may become the underclass of the 21st century. Globally, there is a digital divide by which most people in rich countries, but few in poorer countries, are part of the information revolution. Durkheim, Weber, and Marx greatly improved our understanding of industrial societies. As we continue into the post-industrial age, there is plenty of room for new generations of sociologists to carry on. What do you think? 1. As we try to understand the information revolution that defines our post-industrial society, which of the founding sociologists considered in this chapter do you find most useful? Marx, Weber, or Durkheim? What do you think of the goal of Microsoft Bill Gates to have a computer in every home? In what ways has the development of the computer technology made our lives better? Try to be specific about what has improved. 3. In what ways do you think computer technology has harmed our society or made life more challenging? Again, be specific about the problems that you see. Seeing Sociology in Everyday Life, the orange section in this book, page 107, chapter 4. Does having advanced technology make society better? The four thinkers discussed in this chapter all had their doubts. Here's a chance for you to do some thinking about the pros and cons of computer technology in terms of its effect on our daily lives, on our everyday lives. For each of the three photos shown here, answer these questions. What do you see as the advantages of this technology for our everyday lives? What are the disadvantages? In this photo, there is a stock photo of a white man on his, uh, looks like an apple. He's laughing. Mark has recently started a new job, and he decided to carry a laptop equipped so that he can access the internet and receive email even out on the lake. What advantages and disadvantages? Just do you think about this technology provides to Mark? He's obviously alone, but he is able to work from the boat. Andy's parents have learned that letting him play video games on a computer tablet ensures that they'll be able to enjoy a distraction-free restaurant meal. Assess the use of computer technology as a form of recreation. So there is a family sitting at a table. It does not look like a restaurant, but the kid is playing on an iPad. And everyone else is looking around at the food being like, I wish I was on my smartphone. So in this case, yeah, certainly it does help to be a babysitter. But as far as connecting humans together and 
bolstering family ties. Does technology ruin that? In this last photo it looks like they're at like a basketball game and there's a woman on a phone and there's people sitting around her and she's just uh, distracted. Whether we're in college or whether we're college students or famous actresses, most of us become accustomed to staying in touch with friends as we ride in the car, wait for our dinner in a restaurant, go for a daily walk, or pass the time during a break in a sporting event. What advantages and disadvantages do you see in cell phone technology? Hint. Page 108. In the first case, being linked to the internet allows us to stay in touch with the office, and this may help, help our careers. At the same time, being connected in this way blurs the line between work and play, just as it allows, may allow work to come into our lives at home. In addition, employers may expect us to be on call 24-7. In the second case, computer gaming certainly can be fun, and it may develop various sensory motor skills. At the same time, the rise of computer gaming discourages physical play and plays a part in the alarming increase of obesity, which now affects more than one in five children. Also, personal computer technology has the effect of isolating individuals, not only from the natural world, but from also other people. In the third case, cell phones allow us to talk with others and to send and receive text messages. Of course, we all know that cell phones and cars don't add up to safe driving. In addition, doesn't talking on cell phones in public end up reducing our privacy? And what about the other people around us? How do you feel about having to listen to personal conversations of people sitting nearby? Seeing sociolog sociology in your everyday one, this is page 108, the defining trait of a post-industrial society is computer technology. Spend a few minutes walking around your apartment, dorm room, or home trying to identify every device that has a computer chip in it. How many do you find? Were you surprised by the number? Two, is modern society good for us? This chapter makes clear the founders of sociology were aware that modern societies provide many benefits, but all of them were also critical of modern society. Based on what you have read in this chapter, list three ways in which you would argue modern society is better than traditional societies. Also point to three ways in which you, can, you think traditional societies are better than modern societies. Three, go to our website where you can read the latest post by a young team of, sociolo team of young sociologists, blah, blah, blah. Making the Grade, page 109. Chapter 4, Society. This is the summation uh, of the past chapter that we have read. Describe how technology, technological development has shaped the history of human societies, page 90 through 95. Gerhard Linsky points to the importance of technology in shaping any society. Hunting and gathering societies have only a few dozen members, are built around family, and are nomadic. Consider men and women roughly equal in social importance. Men use simple tools to hunt animals, and women gather vegetation. Horticultural and pastoral societies raise animals for food and use hand tools to raise crops. Show greater specialization of work, show increasing levels of social inequality. Agrarian societies use plows, harness to animals, or more powerful energy sources to enable large-scale cultivation, show even greater specialization with dozens of distinct occupations, have extreme social inequality, and reduce importance of women. Industrialization uses advanced sources of energy to drive large machinery, moves work from home to factory, and reduces traditional importance of the family. Reduces traditional importance of the family. This is in there twice. Raises living standards. Post-industrialization shifts production from heavy machinery making material things to computer processing information. Requires a population with information-based skills. Is the driving force behind the information revolution, a worldwide flow of information that now links societies with an emerging global culture. Here's some definition terms. Society, people who interact in a defined territory and share a culture. Socio-cultural evolution, Lenski's term for the changes that occur as a society gains new technology. Hunting and gathering, making use of simple tools to hunt animals and gather vegetation for food. Horticulture, the use of hand tools to raise crops. Pastoralism, the domestication of the animals. Agriculture, large-scale cultivation using plows harnessed to animals or more powerful energy sources. Industrialism, the production of goods using advanced sources of energy to drive large machinery. Post-industrialism, 
the production of information using computer technology. Section 4.2, Karl Marx, Society and Conflict. Analyze the importance of class conflict to the historical development of human societies. Karl Marx's materialist approach claims that societies are defined by their economic systems. How humans produce material goods shapes their experiences. Conflict and history. Marx traced conflict between social classes in societies as the source of social change throughout history. In ancient societies, masters dominated slaves. In agrarian societies, nobles dominated serfs. In industrial capitalist societies, capitalists dominate proletarians. Capitalism. Marx focused on the role of capitalism in creating inequality and class conflict in modern societies. The ruling class, the capitalist, oppresses the working class, the proletarians. Capitalism alienates workers from the act of working, from the products of work, from other workers, and from their own potential. Marx predicted that a workers' revolution would overthrow capitalism and replace it with socialism, a system of production that would provide for the social needs of all. Definition box. Social conflict. The struggle between segments of society over valued resources. Capitalists. People who own and operate factories and other businesses in pursuit of profits. Proletarians. People who sell their labor for wages. Social institutions. The major spheres of social life or social subsystems organized to meet human needs. False consciousness. Marx's term for explanations of social problems as the shortcomings of individuals rather than the flaws of society. Class conflict. Conflict between entire classes over the distribution of a society's wealth and power. Class consciousness. Marx's term for workers' recognition of themselves as class unified in the opposition to capitalists and ultimately capitalism itself. Alienation. The experience of alienate isolation and misery resulting from powerlessness. Page 110, Max Weber, The Rationalization of Society. Demonstrate the importance of ideas and development of human societies. Max Weber, idealist approach, emphasizes the power of ideas to shape society. Ideas and history. Weber traced the ideas, especially beliefs and values, that have shaped societies throughout history. Members of pre-industrial societies are bound by tradition. Members of industrial capitalist societies are guided by rationality. The Rise of Rationality. Weber focused on the growth of large rational organizations as the defining characteristic of modern societies. Increasing rationality gave rise to both the Industrial Revolution and capitalism. Protestantism, specifically Calvinism, encouraged the rational pursuit of wealth, laying the groundwork for the rise of industrial capitalism. Weber feared that excessive rationality while promoting efficiency would stifle human creativity. Definition box. Ideal type. An abstract statement of the essential characteristic of any social phenomenon. Tradition. Values and beliefs pass from generation to generation. Rationality. A way of thinking that emphasizes deliberate matter-of-fact calculation of the most efficient way to accomplish a particular task. Rationalization of society. Weber's term for the historical change from traditional... Tradition to rationality as a main type of human thought. Heading, Emile Durkheim, Society and Function, page 110, 4-4. Contrast the social bonds typical of traditional and modern societies. Emile Durkheim claimed that society has an existence apart from its individual members. Structure and Function. Durkheim believed that because society is bigger than any one of us, it dictates how we are expected to act in any given social situation. Social elements such as crime have functions that help society operate. Society also shapes our personality and provides moral, the moral discipline that guides our behavior and controls our desires. Evolving societies. Durkheim traced the evolution of of social change by describing the different ways society throughout history have guided the lives of their members. In pre-industrial societies, mechanical solidarity guides the social life of individuals. Industrialization and the division of labor weaken the traditional bonds so that social life in modern societies is characterized by organic solidarity. Durkheim warned the increase of anomie 
in modern societies as society provides little moral guidance to individuals. Anime, Durkheim's term for a condition in which society provides little moral guidance to individuals. Mechanical solidarity, Durkheim's term for social bonds based on common sentiments and shared moral values that are strong among members of the pre-industrial societies. Organic solidarity, Durkheim's term for social bonds based on specialization and interdependence that are strong among members of industrial societies. Division of labor, specialized economic activity. Section, critical review, four visions of society. Summarize the contribution of Linsky, Marx, Weber, and Durkheim to our understanding of social change, pages 105 through 6, 106. All four see modern societies as distinct from societies from the past. Each thinker highlights a different dimension for change. For Linsky, it's technology. For Marx, it's social conflict. For Weber, it's ideas. For Durkheim, it is the increasing degree of specialization. That is the end of chapter 4, page 110.